，大家好，欢迎来参加我们这场中文沉浸和幼龄儿童教育展望二零三二的讲座。Greetings, everyone. Welcome to this plenary session entitled "Chinese Immersion in Early Language Education 2032." I am Shu Huang Wang,、uh, Project Director of Chinese Early Language and Immersion Network at Asia Society, also known as Selin. I'm very, very honored to be the、uh, moderator of today's、uh, distinguished panel. As suggested by the、uh, title of this panel, we look forward to envisioning. Um, the future, you know, for the field in twenty in ten years.、Um, as many of you know, the Chinese American International School in San Francisco is the first Chinese immersion language schools in the United States, which opened its doors in 1981. Since then, particularly after 2004, we have. Experience a significant expansion of the Chinese language immersion programs in the United States. So where are we now? The Mandarin Parent Council documented 343 Chinese immersion language programs in K-12 schools in 2021. Similarly, American Council for International Education. Also documented, 312 Chinese dual language immersion program. When they call dual language, they are referring to those language、um, immersion model that runs 50/50, 50 in Chinese and 50 in English. And so,、uh, the 312 Chinese dual language program accounted for 8.6 percent of total dual language programs in the United States. And Chinese is the second most popular immersion language after Spanish.、Uh, in Chinese, you know, we also over the years that we also witness the growth of Chinese immersion preschool for children starting from like a year two, three, four, and on. You know, since 2019. Selin has、um, dedicated enormous amount of、uh, research and efforts in、uh, promoting and documenting Chinese immersion preschools.、Uh, we conducted two national、uh, surveys: one of the、uh, Chinese immersion preschools and the other of the teachers who teach in those programs.、Um, we published the three Selin briefs. On the topic of preschool education, and recently, a white paper called "A Blueprint for Chinese Language Preschool Education in the United States: Imagining the Possibilities" has just come out of the oven this week. So, you know,、um, please, um, we'll talk about this paper and the efforts in a Selin session on Sunday at noon. You know, please、uh, join us then. For our conversation today, we like to, you know, journey with our panelists to see how their marvelous Chinese language programs have developed over the years. We'll also invite them to discuss some challenges, you know. And share their visions for the for their schools and for the field in ten years.、Um, at the end, we'll also invite them to offer some、um, advice and、uh, suggestions on how to get there. So, let me take this opportunity to、uh, introduce our panelists in alphabetical order:、um, Makita Alexander, who's the、uh, You know, CEO,、uh, executive director of Washington Yuyin International Public Charter School in Washington D.C. Hi, Alexander. I mean, I always got it mixed up. Hi, Makita. <laughs> Good morning, Suhan. Hi, Susan Berg, who's the、uh, CEO and also executive director of Inhua Academy in、um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
Hi, Susan. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Stephen Chang, who's the founding <laughs> principal of Irvine International Academy in Irvine, California. Hi, Stephen. Good morning, Dr. Wang. Good morning, everyone. Hello Good from morning. California. And the last but not the least, you know, Eric Peterson, who's the founding principal of uh, West County Mandarin Schools in, you moved on me, Pino, California. Hi. Yes, Eric. that's right. Good morning, Shuhan. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Um, we are so pleased that you are with us this morning. And uh, the stories of your program, you know, really are also historical accounts of the, you know, how Chinese immersion programs and the field has developed. So would you please introduce yourself, your role, and the context of your school? We'd also appreciate if you can give us a little reflection on your school's journey over the years. So why don't we start with uh, Makita first, and then later we'll mix our order. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Shuhan. I feel so very honored to be here with you and such a distinguished group of panelists. So I'm Makita Alexander, the Executive Director of Washington Yuying Public Charter School in Washington, D.C. We're the only Chinese Immersion International Baccalaureate primary years program in, the, in D.C. Um, so we're a pre-K-3 to fifth grade public charter school that opened in the fall of 2008. And so that means that it's free. Anybody can come in as long as they live in the district. Uh, we opened with 128 students, and this fall we'll have over uh, 600. Yu Ying is one of the most racially diverse schools in the nation, but less than 3% of our students are heritage speakers. Uh, each year we have a wait list over 1,100 students. So it's a very popular school. And so I'll just share a few highlights from our 14 year journey. So year one, Ewing opened up at the fall of 2008 with 128 students in grades pre-K four to first grade. And each year we added a grade until fifth grade. In year four, Ewing moved to its current location. And so we're really lucky to be on three beautiful acres in the city. We call it our urban oasis. In year six, we added a preschool program. And so we had three classes of full day pre-K three in year 10, Yu Ying changed our immersion model for kindergarten and first grade to, an, to address an achievement gap we started to see in English language arts and Chinese language arts, and also to address some growing needs um, that we saw students were having with social emotional learning. And then I'll just jump to year 14. We're really excited that Yu Ying applied for and was granted something called an equitable access preference. And so what that means in DC, that students who are the furthest from resources, um, and a lot of those students didn't have access to high quality education, they now have seats at Yu Ying because each year we're setting aside a certain percentage of seats to make sure you know, that everybody in the city has access to high quality education. And we're really excited about that. Um, that helps with not only our racial diversity, but our socioeconomic diversity. So it's been a really, um, it's been a really fantastic 14 years. We've done, you know, made lots of changes, um, but we're really proud of our immersion program. Wonderful. How about you, Susan? All righty. Um, well, my name is Sue Berg, and I am the CEO Executive Director of Ingwa Academy. And interestingly, I've been here for 10 years. So in preparing for today's panel, I enjoyed looking backwards 10 years and enjoyed looking forward, as Shuhana suggested, to the next 10 years and what might happen. So Ingwa is an early full immersion in kindergarten and first grade. So it's a 90-10 program. Um, continuing on in second through fourth grade, we're 80-20. And probably more uniquely in our middle school, our fifth grade is 70-30. Our seven, sixth and seventh grade are 60-40, finally ending up with a 50-50 program in the eighth grade. So um, we're, we're dedicated to Chinese. <laughs> this school opened with just 79 students in 2006. As I mentioned, uh, only kindergarten through grade three. And currently, 
we have 833 students in kindergarten through grade eight, adding after 2006, adding one grade per year until our first graduating class was in 2012 and we had four students. This year we'll graduate 89 eighth graders. So <clears throat> That uh, makes a grand total of 455 students who have matriculated amazingly to 66 different high schools in the Twin Cities. So again, uh, much like Makita, our, our breadth is broad. We, we uh, attract students from over 90 zip codes in the tw Twin Cities. Um, we're proud to have been recognized as a Confucius Classroom of the Year and as well a National Blue Ribbon School. In addition, we've uh, tried to up our game. We've won a number of statewide innovation awards. Um, our core principles, and I think this is really what has guided our journey, uh, number one is safety. And of course, during COVID, what could have been more important? Number two, core principle is speak Chinese. Number three is learn. Number four is happiness. And number five is global citizenship. So these guiding principles have really supported our goal of striving to maximize each of our students' potential. And still, we see ourselves as a work in progress and that motivates us to learn and grow. When I think of our journey, I think that our uh, a school's journey is similar to that of a child. You're born, you're a toddler, you learn to walk and talk, you have huge growth spurts, then you you enter school, uh, you're, you're building confidence, your world expands, and uh, here we are in our 16th year and we hope we've added maturity and we're now able to, to really concentrate on the future and, and the fine tuning of uh, our program at Ingwa. And that's been our journey. That's wonderful. I remember visiting your school in 2006 or or a seven or eight, and and then um, we filled the, um, um, the 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 school for Asia Society's uh, promotion on Chinese language yes. program. Yes. Yeah, and at that time there wasn't any um, much many uh, Chinese immersion programs at all. It's true. It's yeah. true. Thank you. So, thank you. And Stephen. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Stephen Chuang, the founding principal of Irvine International Academy in Irvine. Uh, the journey of this school is that uh, starting back in July 2020, when uh, the <laughs> pandemic really hit everywhere in the world, that we have this vision to start a brand new uh, mental immersion charter school in Irvine because uh, the uh, Demographic structure in city of Irvine is that more than 50% population is Asian, but there is no public charter school or public school with a mental immersion program in Irvine. So that's why we want to advocate for the uh, Asian community in Irvine and started from the petition. So, um, the, uh, so I led the petition. Uh, with no school side, no students, no parents, but with a group of uh, teachers who share the same vision. So we started there, started a petition. Uh, I remember I started so many Zoom meetings to meet with the uh, supporters to support the petition. And then uh, on June 20, uh, January, I'm sorry, on January 6th, 2021, the uh, Orange County Department of Education finally approved our petition. So uh, back from June, uh, January 2021, we only have six months to, fi to find a school site. And then starting from there, start started from scratch. So um, we are able to hire six Mandarin teachers and six English teachers and uh, recruited over 350 students. So our school is really unique because usually a brand new program will start from uh, kindergarten or TK, but we started from TK to fifth grade during our first year. So as you can see, there are many, many challenges that we have to overcome and 
also there are many many um, um, problems for first year school which we are uh, managing it and we have support from our community and now we almost finish our first year so that's the journey of this school uh, going to second year um, in August and our uh, enrollment will expand from 320 to 410 at least and expand our program to sixth grade. Wow. Yes. This is uh, really incredible. And, and this is not the, sec not the first school that you were the principal. And um, your past experience as a Chinese language teacher in Philadelphia and also in heritage language communities really prepared you for taking on this pioneer job. You know, it's a uh, congratulation. So impressive. Hi, Eric. Hey. Hey, Sharon. Well, thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, today with uh, you and, and the other panelists here today. It's a privilege. So, um, yeah, so West County Mandarin School, we, we were uh, started in 2017. Um, we were started because we had uh, a group of parents that came to our superintendent in our school district here, West Contra Costa, located in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they said, we want to start a charter school. And, uh, you know, our school district uh, superintendent said, oh, no, not another charter school. All our kids will disappear. They're, you know, <laughs> they, they, the fear that you have, you know, um, that they have. So um, they grabbed me because they knew that I was actually a founding parent and a school board member and board president of uh, Yu Ming Charter School in uh, Oakland. And they said, would you help us, uh, you know, create our own district school here? I was a principal of a Spanish DLI school. So, uh, so uh, that's where the journey began. We, um, we met with, um, I contacted the Asian Society. I said, do you have anybody that can help us out? And they uh, uh, referred Shuhan to us. And uh, as soon as I met Shuhan, I said, oh my goodness, this is the person we need to partner with to, to take this journey. So um, it's been great. Since then, uh, you know, West County Mandarin School is a diverse by design school. So we've had, um, uh, that means that from the inception, we've set aside 50% of our seats for students that um, uh, are uh, considered uh, from low-income households uh, or are English learners or are foster youth. And so, um, you know, and getting the school started, we started out with uh, three grade, three classes in kindergarten. So we started slow, just one, one uh, grade at a time. And... Um, you know, we worked with uh, parents of African-American students studying Chinese, a local organization of, of African-American parents to help us recruit in our community. We're a very diverse school district. We also worked with um, uh, Latino, um, Latinx uh, parent groups. Um, you know, I, uh, I did a lot of recruitment. It was kind of a joke because, you know, I would get kicked out of parking lots uh, trying to uh, pass out flyers and, and things like that. Um, you know, going to, to food uh, distribution lines to, to talk to parents uh, and things like that to try to make sure that we had a school and, and that was truly diverse. And also um, the word get, that the word could get out in our school district that Mandarin is for everyone um, and learning Chinese culture is for everyone. And so, you know, those were um, there's a lot of uh, ground floor um, type of recruitment that happened. But now our school uh, is, uh, has 350 students. We're at K-4, um, and we'll be adding fifth grade next year. Um, we have uh, waiting lists uh, in every one of our grades. Um, you know, we, um, as our school developed, we ended up um, uh, becoming an IB school as well, mm -hmm. uh, International Baccalaureate uh, Primary Years Program School. And I believe we're still at this time um, the only um, international baccalaureate primary years program public school in a school district in the whole state of California. Um, and so, um, you know, we've been uh, fortunate to be a model. We've had visits from our state superintendent of public instruction, um, several visits this year as they're working to really expand dual language immersion programs. Um, and we also have an international program uh, component as well to kind of make sure that people in our school district see the big picture, that 
We're an international baccalaureate school building global competencies and learning Mandarin is, and learning Chinese culture is, is very important to building global competencies in this uh, current age. Um, and uh, we also take students in high school and middle school outside of our school, um, pre-pandemic, uh, hopefully we'll resume soon, to Chinese speaking world um, for trips and things like that, um, students of all backgrounds. So we create a real, um, our school really focuses on building global competencies and, and recognition that Chinese immersion, you know, is a real critical component in, in that pathway for preparing students for future set, success in the college and career. Thank you. That is so true. And, and actually listening to all of you, you know, mm -hmm. one, realize, you know, um, having a very high vision is the key to success. You need to have a very high vision. And so, you know, you kind of can't, that can uh, help you attract all different families and different, you know, um, people to stakeholders to dedicate their efforts with you, you know, along the way, because you cannot build a school by yourself or by just whoever wants to do it. And another key is that, you know, all of you have repeatedly emphasized the notion of equitable, you know, access to learning. Because I think that's one of the issues the Chinese field is facing is that often it's being criticized as an elite program, you know. And all of you are making such an effort in trying to ensure that all students have opportunity to learn in your school. So that's really remarkable. And speaking of that, so of course we want to talk about the future. Meanwhile, though, we need to be mindful that the Chinese language field is experiencing a very rough time. You know, for one thing, the COVID has forced us to be isolated, but the upside is also to force us to adapt to new ways of teaching, learning, and managing the school. On the other hand, we are also hearing a lot of uh, negative, you know, public discourse uh, in some of the uh, communities, and that has created challenges for some schools. So under such a context, the macro environment, how do you envision your school and the field will look like in 10 years? Anyone would like to take on first? I can. Okay. Okay, so starting from uh, California, I actually see more opportunities for local communities to start a, a mental immersion program, even preschool or elementary school. This because uh, uh, education had nothing to do with politics. No matter what happened between the United, United States and China, I think the demand is there and it's always good for our students to know more than one language. And the biggest market is still in China. That's the fact that no one can deny and the demand is there. So I, I do see that um, we do need to put more collaborative efforts to advocate our local communities to work together to start a petition in your local um, educational agency to start a Mandarin immersion elementary school with the Mandarin immersion program. So I strongly encourage uh, uh, the communities to work together. That's my vision for the Mandarin immersion program. Wonderful, xie And uh, next person would like to share? I'll go. Um, so I think it's a really exciting question. Our schools are producing global citizens who will be living and speaking Chinese all over the world. So I think that um, language immersion schools are going to triple by 2032. I, I can just, you know, think of my own kids right now. I will have three, you know, children who will want their children to also be multilingual. Um, we're producing global citizens. Our alumni will be in the workforce and they'll have multilingual families. And so I don't think access or the need for immersion schools are going to go away. I think it's going to be much more common. I think what Eric's doing in California 
um, will probably see that all over the, the country. And they won't be charters or independent schools, but language immersion schools will be more part of, of public school districts. Wonderful. Yeah. And um, I, I love your number, triple. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. I love it. Yeah. Susan? Sure, I can go next. Well, I, I think that uh, as charter school folks, we're, we're sort of pioneers. And so I think COVID has forced us to be pioneers once more because there was no guidebook <laughs> to say, how in the world do we do this? And when only 5% of our parents speak Chinese, there was a lot of worry in March 2020 when we went to full distance learning. Our 800 and some children and their parents were worried sick because 95% of our parents don't speak Chinese. So how in the world would they support their children at home? And uh, we did it. And so I think despite the challenges of the pandemic externally, um, we, we were able to remain strong internally. And I think to Makita's point, uh, when we bring people on tours right now in the school, uh, so few people have, so few parents have been immersion school uh, students themselves, and so it's very foreign to them. But again, to Makita's point, already our oldest graduates, um, the very exciting news is that we actually have one of our graduates that teach at Ingwa, and we have one of our graduates who's an educational assistant. And so that is full circle, and we can only imagine. Remember, we only had four graduates in the first year or so, and the next year, 11. So it's it's taken us a while to get to 89. But uh, I, I think when we started in the in the full distance learning, we uh, were very aggressive. We had full Zoom classes from 8.30 to 3.30, and our parents thought we were absolutely crazy for the first two weeks. And then they were extremely grateful and kept saying, oh my goodness, our relatives, our neighbors, you know, they're lucky to have one hour, one hour a day with their, with their, uh, with their school uh, teachers. And so um, I, I think, again, we stayed true to our mission. We just didn't waver. We didn't give up on a research-based educational program and rigorous academics and uh, immersion in Chinese language and culture. Uh, of the seven Chinese immersion schools in the Twin Cities, one of them during COVID uh, ended up hiring uh, native-speaking English people to teach in their school in English. So fortunately, we, we didn't have to do that. And I think for, for Ingwa, one of the ways that we've um, sort of identified ourselves is our, our kindergarten through grade, grade eight niche. So we don't, in Minnesota, we can't financially unfortunately have a preschool or pre-k and although we've had a lot of pressure to add a high school we've determined that our students that are in our immersion program for nine years are ready to fly <laughs> like they want to take other languages they want to take every ap class or ib class in the universe and they're not going to take those in chinese so i think we've we've come uh, to peace with that with that niche in our in our program. So, I I agree. If we can sustain the last have sustained and been steady these last two years, I'm extremely hopeful for the future. I think it's it's very bright. Thank you, thank you, and Eric. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with what's been said. I think that um, for us. You know, what's the adage, what doesn't kill you, makes you stronger, you know? And, you know, going through the pandemic and creating a really robust distance learning program with lots of Zoom, you know, live instruction. I mean, I think that that really helped us to innovate. And also as a new school, it really showed that we have, we're a resilient school, you know, that uh, we might be new, but we have, have a, a real, um, you know, strength in our, in our community and our program. And, I think the key thing for longevity and realizing your vision, which I think has been said, is really having your values uh, really well articulated, you know, and, and for our school, you know, those values are a diverse, equitable and inclusive community, caring for our world and each other, academic excellence and rigor, perseverance, inquiry and well-being. And it's, it's just really important that we hold to that. Um, and those are community developed values. 
And I say that because we also saw that for our school and me as a parent of, a, of children that have gone through Mandarin immersion, that it's important, especially if you're trying to recruit students from diverse backgrounds, heritage speakers, Chinese heritage, but also students from all backgrounds, that you articulate a strong vision for the future. And so our school really focuses on global competencies, preparing our students for success, you know, in, few, in careers that haven't even been invented yet and in the global economy. And um, being, uh, learning language, you know, language immersion, learning another language, becoming trilingual even, not just bilingual, um, are critical skills for our students. So um, we also, as an IB school now, we see ourselves as part of a continuum. We're the PYP school. Our district is adding an MYP middle years program. And then we're also, we also have a, a, you know, a um, diploma program, a DP program at the high school level. So families really see how our school is part of this continuum of building our students for success um, in the, um, you know, it, you know, in the future. So I'm hoping that uh, our students um, will be great alumni that will be thriving college and career and will be, uh, you know, um, helping just to continue to come back and strengthen our school uh, in that regard as well. So thank you. Well, yeah, definitely. I think all your points are well taken because, you know, from what you're saying, I get, you know, number one, to continue to advocate for the learning of Chinese because, because Chinese is here to stay. And in fact, that reminded me of a one important point that we mentioned in the white paper is that, and Makita's number reminded me of that, is that we did a study and in the United States, you know, from K to 16, including colleges and heritage school students, we have 500,000 students learning Chinese. But in China, English is a mandatory school subject starting in grade three and up. And that is one of the college, you know, um, subject matter for college entrance examination. So in China, there are 260 million K to 12 students learning China, uh, learning English. And so with that kind of mandatory program, you know, curriculum, um, Chinese people are more or less bilingual, biliterate. And here we are, we need to reflect on our educational policy. And um, all of you also said the vision, the value, and uh, thinking about longevity and getting everybody uh, to work together and especially on um, innovation part. I think that's really well said, you know, because um, Actually, in 10 years, I don't know what kind of tools that we are going to have for learning, you know, and, but of course, you know, human connection is still the key to success, to social emotional learning and, and growth and happiness. So during our planning um, discussion, we also agree that the teacher pipeline in the United States is broken. Can you talk a little bit about why Chinese language immersion teachers, a special breed, is so hard to come by? And talk a little bit about your experiences and observations. And most importantly, give some advice to policymakers in the local, state, and federal governments, universities, and community at large. How do we work to fix the uh, broken teacher pipeline? to ease the teacher shortage issue, because we do need to have effective teachers to build a field. Without them, the field won't be here. So who would like to go first? I'll go first okay. as the, old, the oldest person with the most history and the oldest school. So I, I think as you say, Shuhan, of course, native teachers of Chinese are less plentiful in this, uh, as, as we say, and of course, that's because there are 343 Chinese immersion programs. So in the Twin Cities alone, there are seven. Um, so I, I think that our best recruiting tool, and Dr. Lian and I have sort of 
weathered this uh, journey over the last 16 years. And in the beginning, I, I remember Louis saying to me, oh my goodness, Sue, I think we'll have to go to China, go to Taiwan. I don't know where we're going to find teachers, but we've really found that our best recruiting recruiting tool has been happy teachers who are proud of Ingwa. And so as the authors of What Color Is My Parachute state, word of mouth is a powerful influence. Um, just think what it takes to con convince a teacher to move to Minnesota. You're in California and DC and New York and wildly exciting warm places. So um, it was 40 degrees this week and it's almost May. So I, I would also say that what, something really powerful that has been advan advantageous for us is our involvement in Celine and NCLC and Star Talk and Actful. Um, Dr. Leanne, our teachers, uh, we have been presenters and participants and that has really helped us to earn a respected reputation. Um, I, I think that um, we also, at, at Ingwa, we have a performance-based employment that rewards value-added contributions. And I think that has really resulted in our ability to attract and retain excellent staff. We're lucky to be a quality compensation school, a QCOMP school. So from the Minnesota Department of Education, we get a, a certain amount of money based on our enrollment, almost $200,000 now that's totally dedicated to developing teacher leaders. And that's been really powerful. Um, our board has been instrumental instrumental in spelling out and supporting H-1B visa and green card possibilities. Uh, we currently have 20 H-1B visas and we have a handful of teachers already in the green card process and so that's been powerful. And uh, I, I think another piece that um, I'm so grateful for, I think I want to show you this. So this is, there we go, <laughs> Dr. Leanne and I, and I think <laughs> we, we found this book called West Meets East, and we thought, wow, that is us to the T. So I think I look at Makita and think of her past uh, administrative uh, units, and I think um, we're, we're, what Louis and I have tried to live is that we, we are East meets West. We are not trying to be just a Chinese school in America, but rather an American school that uses Chinese as the language of instruction. And we're a core knowledge sequence uh, school as well. So um, we, we, uh, have really, we really try to model that for our staff because that's the makeup of our staff. We're about 50% native speaking English and about 50% native speaking Chinese. And I think that's really powerful that everyone feels safe and, and able to question and wonder and contribute. And uh, I think that's what we found to be the most powerful ingredients to, to keeping a strong staff at, at Ingwa. Wonderful. I can uh, jump in on this one too. I think that um, really to grow this pipeline of, um, of, of quality teachers for Mandarin immersion programs, um, definitely at West County Mandarin School, we've been blessed to have, as, uh, as Sue said, you know, having word of mouth is, is critical. You know, building, you know, teachers that are happy, building a real like tight team of teachers um, that go out and eat together and, and do a lot of things together outside of school. That, that's really been important. So, um, but I would say that how do we keep this going as we grow more Mandarin immersion programs across the state and nation? Um, what we really need to do is create more partnerships with universities, nonprofits, um, you know, and frankly, you know, hopefully there'll be some more investment. You know, Chinese is seen as a national strategic language, a critical language. And so we already have programs like Star Talk, which are great. And I hope that we can increase that because our own school, we've actually gotten some teachers uh, and substitute teachers through Star Talk program, you know, the, um, you know, that have come in. We need more alternate, alternative credentialing um, programs um, in California, you know, going through the credentialing process, you know, even though they've made it easier, there's still a lot of hoops to jump through, especially if you were um, have a college degree from um, overseas. And so more flexibility in that route would be great. And of course, that takes some, some lobbying and I'm working on that myself here at the state level in California, you know, to kind of create that. 
but also it was a really untapped potential in our Chinese American communities. Um, you know, especially places where, like here in you know the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, um, like I said, with the Star Talk program, it brought in some local um, teachers that were not credentialed, but just got to you know do the summer program. And then they realized, wow, I really enjoy this. And then we kind of helped them get their substitute credential. And then we said, hey, you're doing great as a sub. Here, why don't you start this um, actual teaching credential program? So um, these are some things that we could certainly do um, to help grow it. Thank you. Uh, I'll just jump in. Um, Eric, we had basically the same idea. And so I think the expansion of Chinese immersion schools are great. It's a double-edged sword, though, because Chinese teachers now have more schools to choose from. And as sunny and warm as DC is, it's also expensive. <laughs> and so it's, it's harder to attract teachers. Uh, Yu Ying relies on what we call teaching fellows in our early childhood program. Teaching fellows make less than, than lead teachers. And so we're asking people to come and make you know, less money in a really expensive city. And so to Eric's point, I would love for um, policymakers to think about strengthening the, the school partnership. I mean, if Yu Ying were a model school and work with one of the local universities, a Chinese teaching fellow would come because after two years, they'd get a certification. And so I, I just think that there has to be more value add for teachers to come you know, and, and work for a lower pay, which is what they do like when you're an internship, like when you're, when you're a fellow. What we found at Ewing is it really takes three years for a teacher to be a good immersion inquiry-based teacher. And so we very rarely get somebody who comes in from day one and, you know, and they, and they hit the target. So I just think that um, if they looked at programs uh, in D.C., there's an urban teacher program. So schools are doing it. It's just not in the immersion field yet. So I think that that'd be a great place for them to, to really lean into. Yes. Yeah. Stephen? Yes. So I, I think I can share my first hand experience uh, as a foreigner coming here in, uh, back in year 2000. And then back at that time, there were really few school with um, Chinese program. So uh, I know the uh, teacher preparation program or so-called teacher credentialing programs were rare back in year 2000, but now I'm sure they have way more teacher preparation program uh, for uh, teachers who would like to teach uh, Chinese in uh, high school or uh, teach elementary school with a mandarin immersion program. Um, so uh, I think the uh, work status, the visa is a big challenge here because uh, uh, a lot of school will have to um, draw the lottery through uh, when they try to apply for the work visa. And another uh, way to get around it is to find a local university with teacher preparation program. So once you have that partnership, then there's no uh, uh, cap exemption. So, this, uh, so you don't have to meet that quota and then can uh, apply for the work visa for your teacher anytime. So that's one way that the uh, school can get around it. Uh, another one would be uh, also have partnership with the lo local school. Um, and for example, like I know there are lots of uh, Sunday or Saturdays Chinese schools and uh, asking if there's any uh, great candidate who would like to become fully certified teachers. Now that's another pub pipeline we, you can try. That's, that's my experience. Thank you. That, that is very true. And um, I am reminded of that we actually have a panel on the teacher pipeline and teachers. So later, you know, I think the conversation can be deepened. Um, but of course, you know, you also mentioned the uh, international teacher. That's a white elephant in the room. You know, we really need to do something about that because the, just relying on homegrown teachers are is not enough. You know, we need to have multiple pipelines for for Chinese language teachers and uh, continuous uh, professional development. So, you know, uh, Makita, 
We um, have a question specifically on preschool. You know, uh, in your school is the only one with a preschool component. So just for the someone in the audience who would be interested in starting a, a Chinese immersion preschool, what's your advice? What would be the pitfalls to avoid or some rewards to gain to get them excited? Absolutely, and I'll keep it brief. Um, so I think starting immersion at age three is great for language development. So these are the, the rewards. Um, they're learning their native language and Mandarin simultaneously. Young children are more apt to take risks in language acquisition. And so when you think about, how, you know, sponge, kids are sponges at age. And so they don't worry about sounding funny or being made fun of because they're three. They're super, super confident in their ability to communicate in both languages. And then I think that there's a greater acceptance of diversity because they're being nurtured by somebody who looks, in our case, completely different. So I think that that's fantastic. Um, just a few pitfalls to avoid. I think assuming that anyone who can teach can teach three-year-olds is a very bad assumption. It takes a special teacher to teach a three-year-old. Um, Let's see, ensuring that your staff understands cognitive development of that age group, like what a three-year-old can do. Uh, and then I would say lastly, making sure that um, reminding the teachers that they're the first entry point to your school. And so, you know, these are these are teachers that get, these are kids that come in at three and stay in the school for a long time. And so just making sure that they're really adept in communicating with parents and they understand, you know, really the, the community and the culture of the school. And then just lastly, um, making sure that the preschool teachers are fluent in English. These are kids whose language development um, has, it's not always developed. And so, you know, kids get frustrated if they think they're not understood. And so just making sure that the, the teacher understands like English or whatever language, you know, that the kids are speaking and then listening out for those local colloquialisms. We've had so many, um, instances where kids are saying things and the Chinese teacher doesn't necessarily understand what they're saying and then the kids get frustrated and they go home and tell their parents and so just making sure to take special care um, for that. That's well said. Those are golden nuggets, you know. Yeah, we can continue on, you know, for another session sometimes. Um, now, we are coming down to our last question, and that is we all share, all of you share the visions for the school and the field. Um, some advice, thoughts, or actions that we can take to realize this uh, vision? I can start. Okay. Okay, so as I met uh, our prospective parents regarding the vision for the school, we want our kids not only to become bi bi uh, bilingual, but also we would like them to become the leaders in the community, mm -hmm. especially in the uh, United States. We need more uh, Asian leaders in the field of politics and education. So um, I do see that is, you know, my mission at this school and it's, it's hopefully extended to middle school and high school. So uh, we want to advocate more Asian leaders in the field of education. True. Yeah, like yourself, really. Yes. I have seen you develop, you know, full bloom. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, and uh, who would like to take next? I'll go. And this okay. is a little self-serving. I have three children who um, attended my school. And so they will be, um, you know, alumni of sort of Chinese immersion uh, programs. I think that there should be some type of alumni network for mm. students who attend Chinese immersion schools. I think to be able to share opportunities, scholarships, fellowships to really strengthen that community. Um, I think that that's something that that we should think about sort of as the future, the, the next steps of being part of a, a larger growing immersion community. Just like Eric, we talk about creating, um, you know, global citizens. Chinese is spoken everywhere. And so you can go to Argentina, Africa, Brazil, everywhere and speak Chinese. But I, I think that um, some type of unifying factor would be fantastic. That is so well said. What a great idea. Uh, Susan and Eric, you'll be the last. Yes. So I, I think that uh, as excellent as we are as a, and true to our Chinese immersion uh, 
uh, goals. I think that we've experienced that you really need to strive to provide the full meal deal, as we say. Um, you have to realize the necessity of developing excellent English, art, music, PE departments that are really second to none, mm -hmm. as well as, of course, excellence in all subjects at Ingwa that are taught in Chinese, which, of course, Chinese, math, science, and social studies. I think the other thing we've learned about middle school kids, middle school kids have a big voice and their parents in America listen to them. So the middle school kids have to be personally attracted to staying. It's not the wow factor anymore. When you're in kindergarten and you speak Chinese, everyone is going, wow, amazing. So I think we've discovered for our middle school kids that it's really critical to offer robust extracurricular offerings like orchestra, choir, debate, robotics, model UN, theater, and sports of all varieties. Mm -hmm. We have soccer, basketball, volleyball, badminton, track and field, fencing. And for our lower school kids, we have an extensive aftercare and enrichment program, um, as well as a music conservatory. The other thing that we learned from Case is that with only 5% of our parents who speak Chinese, we have to really uh, provide opportunity for homework help. So we start the day from 8 to 8.30. Any kid can arrive before the school day starts at 8.30 and the teachers are in the homerooms and they can get help. And at the end of the day, we end with a PM homeroom from 3 to 3.30. And that's been really, really beneficial for everyone. Um, and, and we capitalize on having our kids for nine years. So we spend a lot of time connecting our little people with our big people and maximizing the potential. During COVID, we had 300 what we called dragon duos because we're the dragons. And that meant a middle school kid partnered with a lower school kid over Zoom once a week, every week. And of course it was wonderful for the little people, but we actually got more positive feedback from parents of middle school kids saying, wow, my kid was so isolated during COVID and it mm. was so powerful for them to be responsible for a little person. Um, and I, I think it's also, lastly, I would say it's been really critical for us to think ahead with our parents and students to say what's next after Ingwa. Because if you end at eighth grade, as we do, um, you have to have the next chapter before university. <laughs> they can't go four years with, without Chinese. So we've partnered with Minnesota Online High School and our teachers, our Ingwa teachers, teach the next three high school courses leading up and inclusive of, of AP. So I think that's also been really critical for us to help them envision what's next. So. That's it. That's oh, that's a lot <laughs> to take on. Yes, and uh, Eric. Yeah, I, I think I would ditto everything everybody said, but I would just say that. Excuse me. I think equity of access to Mandarin immersion programs is really critical, um, and also building awareness that that Mandarin and learning Chinese culture is for everyone. Um, and I, we saw a question in the chat about the foreign language assistance program. You know, I, I think definitely like, you know, you Ming, that was critical to get us started. Having money, um, well, you know, strategic uh, investments through um, government and foundations, you know, there it does take more money to, to do a well-run uh, Mandarin immersion school. And, um, you know, so just having those investments that really help focus, especially um, in communities that don't generally have as many much access to Mandarin immersion, that, that's really critical. So I hope we get that, that governmental support, more, more financial support in those strategic areas. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, just like, you know, Makita said, you know, just building those alumni networks, um, you know, that really show um, and build that support over time, that, that's gonna be critical. Thank you. Yes, all of you have shared so many wonderful rich insights. This is incredible. You know, I'm, I'm writing notes like crazy, alumni network and the um, all the different things that you do. And from uh, Makita and Sue's model, I, you know, what you are saying that uh, I was reminded of uh, 
a program that uh, in Portland, Oregon, uh, parents started that, and she started the uh, tutoring program and include, you know, recruit um, higher level, um, you know, Chinese immersion students to be the tutor to pair up with uh, students in the lower level, and the kids really get paid. And they have to pair up, understand uh, each other's interests. And they were saying that uh, students tutor actually have to uh, design curriculum. And the kids love the curriculum so much that you know they're looking forward to having more tutoring sessions. It's just so wonderful because the idea is that we want our kids in higher level, higher grades, to find real use in real life for their language ability, not just, you know, being a little monkey in the restaurant ordering food in Chinese, you know, so that type of thing. And so we really have benefit tremendously from your um, experiences and reflections. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation that we have. And now I, you know, we. This is a, a topic that we'll continue to have because uh, Chinese immersion and early language learning is so critical. And the notion that Eric mentioned that the U.S. government and uh, state, local government as well, and also other entities, the private foundations, really need to think about how do we correct the issue of underinvestment in world language education of the United States. It's time that we wake up to really look at the, the world that everybody speaks English, and even they speak English, they're referencing their own understanding, but not our own understanding of the world. So, you know, I would like to thank our audience for joining us today. And please check out all the uh, sessions related to Chinese language immersion and early language learning at NCLC. There are plenty of them. And uh, we also welcome you to um, contact us to further the conversation. Uh, enjoy the rest of the, the uh, conference. Thank you very much. And thank you, our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Bye-bye.